All right, welcome back everybody. So today is the last lecture in our series on ordinary differential equations, and particularly, how do we integrate trajectories through ordinary differential equations, okay? So the first week, uh, we saw a lot of numerical methods, forward Euler, backward Euler, Runge Kutta 2, Runge Kutta 4. And the last two lectures, we've been trying out our Runge Kutta 4 integrator on numerous vector fields. So we wrote an RK4 single step integrator. We've also compared it against ODE45, which is MATLAB's built-in integrator. And the last example we showed, we took a small cube of particles and integrated them through the Lorentz equations. Okay, so these are equations that were developed in 1963 by Ed Lorentz to describe uh, complex weather systems. And it turns out that they are some of the simplest systems that exhibit chaos. So I wanna just remind you on the computer what this trajectory uh, kind of looked like. <clears throat> so this is a code that was available from the last lecture. Um, so I'm just gonna run the first part to remind you um, we have this kind of cube of, uh, of initial data. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have this cube of initial data um, surrounding an initial condition, okay? And what we're going to do is integrate that cube of data through the Lorentz equations. So if I just run this code, we see the cube. Originally, particles stay pretty close together, but after even a moderate amount of time, significant stretching and folding occurs. And this small cube of initial data now is spread over kind of a, the entire, the entire uh, domain, okay? So this is one of the hallmarks of chaos. Um, and today I'm gonna say quite a bit more about chaos and why it's important to us, okay? <clears throat> so um, just a few words on chaos. And I'm really going to try to motivate this um, discussion with a few really neat examples and also with some historical perspective, okay? So what we've learned before, uh, kind of in the last lecture, is that one of the ways you could describe a chaotic system is that it has sensitive dependence on initial conditions, okay? This is one of the kind of technically correct ways of describing chaos. And we just saw this in the simulation where we took a relatively small cube of particles, right? So you could say that all of those were a nominal trajectory plus a little bit of error. And that error accumulated you know, significantly during our time steps until our final solution really could be anywhere um, just by pushing the initial condition a little bit. Okay, so we saw this, um, we saw this in the Lorentz equation. And the takeaway message, or one of the takeaway messages that we had last lecture was that um, this sensible, sensitive dependence on initial conditions is one way of looking at it, but if we had any numerical error due to the integration scheme we're using, those errors are also going to be magnified in time. So I would just say uh, any small error uh, will be magnified. And it turns out that this error will be magnified exponentially although I'm not gonna show this um, in time. Okay, so in time, any small errors between where my, my true trajectory and my numerical trajectory, those are going to exponentially grow until I really have no certainty at all if my solution's correct. Okay, so this has really important, um, this is error, this has really important uh, ramifications for integrators in general. Okay, the example, um, <coughs> excuse me, the first example I wanna talk about is um, the double pendulum. So example, 
is the double pendulum. And this is nice because we actually have a demo I'll show you in a few minutes for this double pendulum. But I'm just going to draw a picture first, kind of our physics schematic. Now remember, this is not a physics class, but some of the most uh, rich and interesting phenomena do come from physics. So this, you know, this system is going to have equations of motion which follow Newton's laws. Okay, so as with our single pendulum, we have a length, and on that length we have some mass, and there is an angle, theta, which defines kind of the state of this pendulum. Except now we're going to attach another mass, so this becomes length one, theta one, mass one. We're going to include another mass on a second length, L2, M2, uh, and this can have an independent angle, theta two. Gravity still points down, okay? Now, I'm not going to ask you to derive the equations of motion. It's a little tricky. Um, it's significantly easier if you use a Lagrangian framework. Okay, but in principle, this is an extremely simple physical system, right? It has two moving parts. It's the simplest thing we can think of. It's the simplest extension to the pendulum that we can think of, okay? It's very, very simple physical system. Okay. And just uh, so that you're aware, I always post my notes online so you'll have the codes and the PDF uh, that kind of guide this lecture if you want to go over it more slowly. So this is a very physical, physical uh, simple physical system that happens to exhibit chaos. And we'll look at what that means for something to exhibit chaos. It means it's chaotic. Okay, so this is among the simplest systems that exhibits chaos or has chaotic trajectories. And it has a four-dimensional phase space, a four-dimensional phase space. And when I say phase space, I mean if I want to uniquely identify the state of my system, I need to know what theta one and theta two are but I also need to know their velocities. So the angles and velocities, or the configurations uh, and momenta, if you like, define the phase space. So the four-dimensional phase space is given by um, an equation ddt of theta one equals some stuff, ddt of theta two equals some stuff, uh, ddt theta one dot equals stuff, and ddt theta uh, two dot equals some stuff, right? And we can get these from, uh, from the principle of least action or the variational principle if we like. Okay, now one of the things I think is interesting is that we have this kind of four dimensional space where trajectories can move around in, right? I can, in principle, I could see any combination of theta one, theta two, theta one dot, and theta two dot at a given instant of time. And I'm really trying to kind of pack this four dimensional space of solutions onto this uh, lower dimensional configuration space. So this is one of the, the ideas that you might be thinking about for why, um, why such kind of complicated motion would come out of these trajectories. <coughs> okay, uh, maybe I'll just show you in the computer how I would derive these equations because I think you should know. Um, okay, so this is an old simul or sorry, an old presentation I gave when I was in grad school. So what you could do is cook up a Lagrangian, which is uh, kinetic energy minus potential energy. It's a little more complicated for this system. Uh, and then you could use the Euler-Lagrange equations to get four ordinary differential equations just like we wrote down. Let's see if I have, uh, well, I don't have them written down, they're kind of nasty, but you can get pretty, um, you can get four equations of motion, one for theta one, theta two, theta one dot, and theta two dot. Okay, so now I would like to actually show you a demo. Okay, so I'm going to uh, 
we have this physical demo here of a double pendulum. And I hope you can see this. I'm going to move the uh, chair out of the way so that you get a good camera angle. Nice. OK. Now I'm just going to kick one of the pendula so you can see how it, how it looks. OK. Like, this is the kind of motion that a double pendulum, a, a forced, sorry, a free double pendulum with some initial condition will look like this. And it's really cool. You have all of these nice kind of complicated acrobatics. I think of them as acrobatics because you have this inner blue pendulum moving on its own, and then you have this kind of larger uh, black pendulum, the first pendulum that can also rotate in any direction they like. OK. OK, very simple physical system. Now, the cool thing about this demo is that I actually have two separate double pendula. So let's say I can run them both. I can start them both from approximately the same initial condition. But notice that after a very short amount of time, they actually have pretty different behaviors. Well, sometimes they synchronize, sometimes they don't. OK. So I'm going to do a couple, of, uh, a couple of demos a couple of times. I just want to kind of um, bring this idea home. So the first idea is that if I, only, um, if I only perturb the pendulum very slightly, right? so I pull it a small angle and let it go, then it acts basically like a single pendulum. Not exactly, but it's pretty, pretty simple. And so I can start both pendulums at the same small displacement and let them go. And they're going to stay synchronized for quite some time. Right? Both of the motions are very simple. This does not appear to be a really chaotic uh, system so far. OK. And we could do this until they come to rest. OK. So now, let's say I put a little bit more energy into the system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start them from a higher energy initial condition. I'm going to start from this kind of right angle elbow initial condition. And I'm going to try to get them as close as I possibly can and then release at the same time. So I'm going to go three, two, one, go. Now, for the first few acrobatic maneuvers, they actually tracked each other remarkably well. But within a very short amount of time, we see that there's completely different motion. And I had these things starting as close as I could to the same initial condition. So this is exactly what we mean by sensitive dependence on initial condition. Let's try it one more time. So usually, I would have a student, uh, a couple of students do this demo. But here we go. I'll try to do my best. OK, I'm going to start from the same condition, and then I'm going to release. So I think my initial condition was pretty good, but now the trajectories have completely diverged. Very different motion. They're not tracking each other at all. OK, so this is kind of the heart of chaos. OK, and it's always fun to just kick this thing uh, as hard as you can just because you get some really phenomenally cool uh, motions. These are relatively easy to build um, at a machine shop, incidentally. I have a good friend uh, on the East Coast who builds these double pendula and puts LED lights in each of the arms and then takes them to the Burning Man Festival. Okay, So you can definitely build these yourself, um, or you can order them online. They use roller blade bearings. OK, great. So that's kind of the demo I wanted to show you. So now we'll go back to, uh, to thinking about kind of the math underlying this and the, the kind of MATLAB implementation. OK? So we have this very simple physical system with four equations of motion. They're not terribly complicated. Yet, if I start with two initial conditions that are very, very close to each other, they kind of diverge exponentially in a very short amount of time. OK? That's what chaos means. OK, so that was a few words on chaos. And hopefully, we'll have a few more. Um, OK, so let's see. Is there anything else I want to say about this? 
yeah, so I guess the, um, the second major point I want to bring up is that this sensitive dependence on initial conditions may be very challenging for numerical integration. Okay. So let's see what I mean by this. Uh, what I mean is when I started these two pendula at as close as I could get to the right initial condition, you know, my eyes and, and uh, ability to set these things up exactly is pretty clumsy, right? I can't get within sub-millimeter precision, I would bet. And the actual devices themselves are not manufactured to extraordinarily high uh, technical specifications. However, in my computer, I can start two trajectories very, very, very close to each other, right? So for example, in my computer, I can represent numbers with double precision. So I would have errors on the order of 10 to the minus 16. But the really interesting thing about this uh, kind of sensitive dependence on initial conditions is that any errors I have, even if they're 10 to the minus 16th, they will start to grow exponentially in time. And within a very short amount of time, I'll actually have uh, order one errors, meaning that trajectories are doing completely different things. <coughs> and you can imagine that the biggest source of error when I'm time stepping is my numerical integration scheme. So if I use forward Euler, I'm gonna have huge errors every time step. If I use RK4, I'll have pretty small errors, but even those very small errors are going to accrue and grow exponentially. Okay, um, so most integrators in fact, we developed one uh, a few lectures ago. So most integrators are trying to minimize the error per time step, right? So remember, we Taylor expand, so they're trying to minimize error uh, at each time step, at each delta t. So we could take the Taylor expansion of our you know, true trajectory and try to match as many terms as we can with our integrator. So that's what Runge-Kutta does. Right, but even very, very, very small errors at each delta t are going to become big problems. So there's an alternative. I don't want to undermine the integrators we've spent so much time working for. So Runge-Kutta 4, or ODE 4, 5 if you like, is still a very good baseline integrator. I'm just pointing out that it's not always infallible. It can sometimes give you answers which are extraordinarily wrong. So instead of minimizing local error, okay, instead of minimizing the local error, error what we're going to try to do we will try to preserve some conserved quantities. Okay. Now, what do I mean by conserved quantities? So if we go back to the double pendulum board, what is a conserved quantity for this system? Right? So one conserved quantity uh, is the energy. So in my physical example, there's a little bit of friction in the bearings and there's wind resistance, but if you neglect all of those uh, small effects, then, then the system conserves energy. It'll just keep swinging and swinging and swinging forever, okay? And so for example, instead of trying to minimize our local error of every time step, which we know are going to exponentially grow no matter how good we are, we're going to try to preserve a conserved quantity such as, let's conserve the energy. So this is one really good choice. And integrators that do this are called symplectic. So now I'm just calling, I'm telling you the names of things, but I'm gonna tell you the properties too. So this is a symplectic integrator. Very cool, um, symplectic integrator. Instead of trying to minimize the local error, it tries to keep the energy conserved. 
This is kind of our first alternative. Our second one is something called a variational integrator. Um, we're going to conserve, instead of energy, let me see if I can write this down. Um, so we have DDT partial L partial theta dot minus partial L partial theta equals zero. This is the Euler-Lagrange equation. So what the second method tries to do is it tries to make this quantity as close to zero as possible at every time step, which is a little bit different than minimizing the time step error. So here what we're trying to do is make the EL equations as close to true as possible. Basically, we're going to try to get these um, this as close to zero as possible. And this is called a variational integrator. OK, and these are actually two of the best, uh, the best state-of-the-art integrators that we have available to us today. These are phenomenally good integrators. Um, the downside, this is not a small downside, this is a significant downside, is that these integrators are not general purpose. I can't just write a canned integration routine and use it for any system. I actually have to cook up a special variational integrator for my double pendulum and a special variational integrator for my uh, spacecraft flying to Jupiter. Okay, And people do it because they're worth the time it takes in man hours or human hours. They're worth it in the, in the accuracy. Okay? But they're not specialized, or they're not generalized. These are specialized integrators. OK, now let's see. Uh, I'm not going to actually derive these integrators for you because they require uh, a significant background in advanced physics. So you really have to be very comfortable with Lagrangian dynamics uh, and Hamiltonian systems. And I know some of you are. And so I'm including my lecture notes on this. And you can see how I derive it. Um, I also include the actual code for a variational integrator on the double pendulum. But you know, that's not the main point. The main point I want to show you in the video is the performance. Okay, So if we go to the computer, I have a video here in my uh, computer. So I generated all of these plots when I was a grad student. Uh, this is for a course project. And if I run this, what I'm doing is I'm starting three different simulations of a double pendulum starting at the top position, and I give it a tiny little kick. OK, so the, the integrator on the left is my benchmark integrator. That's what we call our best approximation to true. And this is what's called a runga kutta felberg 7 8 integrator. So you might guess that this thing has local error properties of order delta t to the eighth power. It's very good and uh, global error properties of order delta t to the seventh. Okay, So that's our benchmark integrator. Now, <coughs> excuse me. It turns out that this RK78 integrator is actually approximately symplectic. What that means is it, uh, it almost conserves the energy, which makes it one of the best integrators around, I'm actually including a copy of my treasured RK78 integrator in this uh, set of lecture notes. I inherited it from a Spanish postdoc at Caltech. Um, he wrote it painstakingly and tested it. And it's the best integrator I have. Okay? And it actually is a general purpose integrator, which is fantastic. Okay. So that was the first integrator. So the Runga Kutta 7 8 is our benchmark true integrator. In the middle, I have this variational integrator I was talking about. So I actually had to cook this integrator up from scratch for the double pendulum. And then on the right is our uh, kind of all purpose MATLAB ODE 45. So let's see what happens. I hit go. And they all seem to be doing the right thing at first, which is really good. 
But after a reasonably short amount of time, we see that ODE45 kind of starts to systematically fail and disagree with the other two correct solutions. And finally, if I integrate for a really long time, we'll even see that my variational integrator starts to disagree. So I could decrease the time step of my variational integrator uh, and it would do better. But basically, the Runge Kata 4 scheme is kind of doomed. I can't cut the DT enough to make it better. So let's see if I have any uh, plots to indicate what's happening here. Um, so both of the pendulums start with the same angular velocity and the same energy. And what we find, so energy should be conserved in the simulation. And what we find is that our benchmark and variational integrators both conserve energy for the most part. But very, very quickly, ODE45 has energy that actually blows up. And this is kind of one of the, the reasons that, uh, that this integrator does not work well. And this kind of motivated people to come up with these variational and symplectic integration schemes. OK, so I think that's pretty cool. Um, this is one of my uh, kind of favorite pet topics is these kind of exotic integrators for dynamical systems. Um, and now you know a little bit about the concerns. This does not mean that we can't use ODE45. Most of the time we can. Um, we can always cut the DT in half or cut it into quarters. But you should be aware that your solutions are not guaranteed to be correct. And in fact, one thing I often do is when I'm plotting a trajectory with ODE45, I'll plot that trajectory and I'll cut my time step in half and plot that trajectory. And if the two agree, it's a pretty good indication that I'm not uh, in a, a really nasty chaotic region. Okay, so let me just say that one more time because this is such an important point, is when you want to tell if ODE45 is doing what you think it should be doing, you simulate with a small DT, and then, or, or, or a, um, a small error tolerance in, in MATLAB, or, sorry, so you simulate it with a small DT, you get a trajectory, then what you do is you cut your DT in half and simulate the same trajectory, and if the two agree, that means you're pretty much uh, right on the money, okay? Okay, good, so that's uh, fun. So let's go back to the board and think about a second example, okay? So the double pendulum is nice. It's kind of a, a fun toy problem. Um, but it's not actually where this theory all began. And in fact, Lorentz's model is not where chaos theory begins. Um, it actually begins a while earlier than that, um, having to do with planetary motion. Okay, So example two is planetary motion. Um, there are some cool uh, video demos of this. Maybe I'll have time to, to show them a little bit. But, yeah, planetary motion. And more specifically, we want to predict the motion. So we want to predict. Um, we not only want to predict where all of the planets and all of their moons will be, say, a week or a year or a thousand years from now, but we also, more importantly, we want to know where are comets and asteroids and big hunks of space debris going to be in 10 or 20 years from now, okay? So this is an extremely hard problem. It turns out that the, even just the three-body problem, so if I just have the Sun and Jupiter and the Earth, just trying to find where the positions are of these three planets for long times is very chaotic. So the, this is called the three-body problem. And it's extremely chaotic. That does not mean that there's not kind of a method to where these planets go or some structure in the statistics of where they are. But it just means that if I start with an initial condition and I integrate it for some long time in the future, it's going to be very, very challenging to, to get that future prediction. So a small error are going to take me to different predictions. Okay? 
And this is actually the problem that, that uh, kind of spawned this idea of chaos. Um, there was a great mathematician, Henri Poincaré, a great French mathematician, who at the turn of the last century, I'm going to say maybe 1906 or 08, I forget the exact date, um, proved that there are no closed form analytic solutions to the, to the trajectories of these planets. So you can't write down, you know, x of t equals square root arc cos t to the third halves power. Like there's no analytic closed form solution to these things. And he actually proved definitively that it doesn't exist and that you cannot find them, which in some sense really motivated the, the growth of numerical methods because we, you know, solving a system in, for example, in freshman physics, when you look at a cannonball trajectory, your professor asks you to solve the system and you write down the solution equals, you know, some polynomial formula in terms of the sine of the angle or something. And that's a closed form exact solution. And that's what everybody had been doing for a long time before, for hundreds and thousands of years, until Poincaré definitively said that there do not exist these solutions for most interesting problems. Okay? This is extremely kind of historically important uh, and interesting. There's also an, an interesting Gauss connection. Gauss was a little bit before Poincaré, but I'm not going to get into that now. Um, and this is used currently by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory out in Pasadena, or JPL. They have a number of competing simulations that they call ephemeris or ephemeri. Ephemeris. And what these ephemeris simulations do is they try to predict the motions of all of the large objects, right, all of the planets and their moons, as far into the future as they possibly can, okay? Um, and there's tons of good reasons to do this. Um, one is because it's an interesting math physics problem, but more importantly, we want to know kind of, is a large asteroid heading for us? So a particularly interesting, this is called the development ephemeris, number 431, was released this year in 2013. And it has a prediction, a very accurate prediction, from 13,201 BC all the way up to AD 17,191. Okay, so this is a very accurate simulation of where the planets are going to be for a time span of around 30,000 years. And this is the best we can do with all of the computational resources we have and the most sophisticated numerical methods, okay? I can't guarantee that this uses a variational method, but I know that they do perform particularly well on these ephemeris tests, okay? Let's see, I think I have a little bit of time to show you some cool demos. So, Let's see, I have a good friend uh, named Shane Ross at Virginia Tech, I believe. And he has some fantastic work that he's done while he was a grad student at Caltech on these uh, simulations of planetary motion. So now he's working on hurricanes because that's another great hard problem is uh, weather and climate. Let's see if I can find this really fantastic uh, movie that he generated a number of years ago. Okay, uh, yeah, I think this is my favorite one. The Petite Grand Tour is how this is called. So I believe that what we have here is in the middle, the big black circle is the sun, and then we have um, <coughs> Actually, I think that in the middle is Jupiter, and the green and red dots are two of Jupiter's moons, and the black curve is a spacecraft that they want to develop. 
that spends a lot of time around each of these moons observing them. This is called the Jupiter Icy Moon Orbiter Mission, or GMO. Uh, the Europeans are actually picking it up under the name JUICY. Um, and these are very, very delicate simulations. Um, we're really actually building a spacecraft to go and watch the moons of Jupiter, and they're using these integrators. Let me see if I can find another. Yeah, this is a great one. So here is a video of the comet Oterma. So this thing has been observed from 1910 to 1980. In the middle, the yellow dot is the sun. And here is Jupiter. We're in the frame that rotates with Jupiter and the sun. And here in, I think, green and red are the actual predicted trajectories and the measured trajectories. So this is really cool stuff, OK? OK, good. While we're here, uh, maybe I will show you a YouTube video of pendulum synchronizing. OK, I think I should be able to find this. So this is kind of the flip side of what we discussed. So with the double pendulum, we saw that two identical copies would rapidly separate in time. But here, for the simple pendula, we're going to see that even though they start out desynchronized, they're actually going to begin to synchronize over time. So I'm just going to watch this play out for a little bit. And look, something very profound happened very rapidly. We see this kind of immediate change where now half of them are actually synchronized. It's almost a little spooky, like, um, like something out of a Pink Floyd movie. And now, even though they started in completely different states, they're all starting to march in lockstep. So a couple of stragglers that are out of phase. But if we fast forward, pretty remarkable stuff. OK, so any ideas why this phenomenon occurs? <coughs> Excuse me. Any idea why all of these pendulas start to synchronize so rapidly and strongly? So maybe some of you have seen this before. It turns out that all of these pendula are on a flimsy card table. Okay, So I have my first pendula, my second pendulum, my third pendulum, and so on and so forth. And they're all sitting on this rickety table. And as they swing out of phase and disjointly, they jiggle the table a little bit. And that jiggling forces their neighbors. And so even if we start them all out at random, probably more of them are swinging one way than the other. And that gives the entire table a kick that way, which starts to kind of neutralize the pendulums that are swinging in the opposite direction. And so this very small amount of coupling on the simple system can actually cause them to synchronize. So this is kind of the flip side of the chaos coin. Sometimes systems that start out very random and have very loose coupling, so sometimes random and loosely coupled. You need the loose coupling, though. Can result in what's called emerging patterns, or uh, just, let's say, patterns. 
So patterns emerge. Um, this is true in the case of these pendula swinging. This is also true for fireflies. So it turns out um, if you go on YouTube and look for synchronizing fireflies, there are great forests uh, in the Northeast and I believe in Germany where the fireflies will begin to blink in unison, lighting up the sky like a strobe light. Very similar phenomenon. Um, it's also believed that this is what's happening in your brain if you have a seizure. So kind of brain uh, network seizures. Um, and the list goes on and on. There's just this phenomenal uh, list of, of these emerging patterns. But I thought I should show you this because I don't want you to think that all systems are kind of hopeless and chaotic and, um, or, or random, OK? OK, so I have a few minutes left. Um, and I think what I would like to do is show you a final example. OK, so the final example I want to show you is called the double gyre. And this is a neat code. Um, some years, this might actually be a homework. Some years, it might not. Um, so we have a double gyre. And a double gyre is just a fancy way of saying that we want to simulate how two ocean basins mix with each other. OK, so I have, it's a very crude toy model where I have one kind of big vortex of flow here and another big vortex of flow here. You can imagine that this is um, two ocean basins meeting, right? These could be circulation currents from the uh, thermohaline conductor or convector or whatever. And these are going to slosh back and forth. And if I'm a little particle in here, I'm going to kind of get mixed up and spend a lot of time in here. OK, this is called the double gyre. Um, I'll just show you a kind of a cool keynote uh, video that I have of what these trajectories look like. Sorry, wrong video. Um, well, maybe I won't. Um, what I'm going to do instead, I'm going to show you some MATLAB code. OK. OK, so this is a code I've written. And I'm going to distribute this with the class so you can find this code and work through it. Um, I might even remove key sections of the code and have a homework problem where you actually fill them in in a logical way. But basically, I have a double gyre vector field. This defines at each location um, physically in space and in time. This thing's now time varying. Um, right, I have this kind of y dot equals f of t comma y, where this is a vector, a vector, right? And this is also a vector. So I've defined this double gyre vector field. This is just something that we've all agreed on as kind of an interesting system to look at. And I have this code called integrate double gyre good, meaning it works. Uh, let's hope it does actually work. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, initialize a grid of particles. OK. And I want my graphics to be on so you can see what's happening. OK. So here, this bottom plot just shows these are all of the particles that I'm going to drop in this mixing basin. And on the top, this is the vector field. It's a little hard to see. Um, at least on my screen, so hopefully you can see it. And then what we're going to do is compute the trajectory from time 0 to time 15, which is one and a half periods of oscillation. Uh, let's see. Too many input arguments. That's not good. Okay, 
something is going terribly wrong in my code. Okay, let's look at the double gyre vector field. Okay, this all looks good to me. Um, Okay, let's see where the error actually is happening. Too many input arguments, double gyre vec t. Ah, that's it. Okay, so I've actually hard coded a epsilon and omega here, and I'm just going to uncomment those. Okay, so sometimes you actually have to read your error messages and not panic. So I'm going to save this. I'm going to go back to my integrate double gyre good. And this should work. I'm going to run this, initialize my field. Um, with a, uh, eps, and omega, I think. OK, and we can actually see the particles moving. Uh, so I need to kill this because I haven't shown you the vector field yet. This is also a eps and omega. OK, so just one more time. Let's see if this works. OK, we can see the top plot shows my vector field kind of sloshing from left to right and back and forth. And in the bottom, we can see this is where passive particles are going. OK, so I think of this as, for example, this is where an oil slick is going, like if I drop a bunch of particles, a bunch of oil particles, now I'm visualizing where they move in this vector field, in this ocean mixer. And already you see some regions where there's not a lot of particles and some region where there's more. Or you might think of these as passive buoys and you just want to sample the ocean in some way. OK, so we're seeing this mixing occurring because we're watching the particles integrate through this basin. And you can play with the vector field and the code to get a feel for everything that's happening here. Um, and hopefully on your screen, you can see these kind of cool patterns that are emerging. Or if you can't, then just run the code on your laptop. And just a final. Um, Maybe I'll stop this. So just a final point. Having a hard time getting this uh, plot. So just the final point is that there are these structures that you can find in the, in the spatial flow field these kind of colorful ridges here that tell you where the most stretching and mixing is going to occur in your flow. So these computations were actively used during the Deep Horizon oil spill to find out regions where it was most likely that you would find oil collecting. Okay, so hopefully um, you've gotten a flavor for the types of interesting dynamical systems that we're going to be working with, some of the neat analyses that, um, so I'm all done with computers. So hopefully um, this gives you a flavor for the really neat things you can do with vector fields um, and integration. And you know, definitely play with these things and get your hands dirty with the code and actually see, uh, see what all is happening, okay, for yourself. Okay, so that is all for the section on ODEs. I hope you enjoyed it. I know that I certainly did. Um, all right, that's all for now. Thank you.